Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning. This is Professor Hamamoto. It is December 29, year 2021, 7.05 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. And this morning, I am joined by a wonderful guest. I've been speaking of her frequently over the last couple of weeks after I discovered her. Well, it's not her first book, but it's first for me. Her name is Kirby Summers, S-O-M-M-E-R-S. -M -M -E and my introduction to this great author, Kirby Summers, was The Billionaire's Woman, subtitled The Memoir of a Sex Slave. And then, of course, given today's, uh, the recent uh, events, well, actually, they go back a couple of years, but there's a trial going on currently featuring one Ghislaine Maxwell. I had to buy the other books. I have I have the complete set. And from what I understand, there are more volumes in the offing. But uh, let me just uh, recommend two at the outset here. One of them is Jeffrey Epstein, Predator Spy. And it's already in its third edition. This is a whopper of a book. It's, uh, it's over 400 pages long. Well worth your purchase. And you can get it directly from the retailer that ate the world, you know what I'm speaking of, and uh, they'll send it to you right away. And the book that we're going to be focusing on today, or the topic, the main topic, is going to be Ghislaine Maxwell. This is another incredible book, um, and uh, the title is Ghislaine Maxwell, an unauthorized biography. And uh, this one tops out at over 300 pages and um, it's currently being revised due to the incredible audience uh, response and commentary to this really really important case it's not only sensational given the the people that are involved but as most of our quality audience knows both Kirby's audience and my own audience know uh, this particular situation featuring Ghislaine Maxwell has repercussions that affects not only U.S. national politics, but international politics, global politics. And that's one of the strong features of Kirby's writing is that she does contextualize these incredible personalities, beginning with her father, Robert. He ended up as Robert Maxwell. His wife is long suffering, and I put that in quotation marks because Kirby Summers is going to disabuse us of some of the <laughs> material that's been written about her. Uh, Betty right, Betty Maxwell, uh, but she puts these characters, and of course, Jeffrey Epstein, she puts these characters into what I really see as an important political context, a socio-political context, and after that long-winded introduction, Miss Summers, I welcome you to the show. We're going to have an incredible conversation. Welcome. Well, I thank you so much, uh, Professor Hamamoto. I am uh, a super fan of yours ever since one of my followers chased me down on my YouTube channel and said, oh my God, you think like Daryl Hamamoto and you have to go follow him and he wants to talk to you and he's read your books. Ever since then, I've been glued to your channel. So thank you so much for having me on. It, it, it's an honor. Well, it's my pleasure and your work needs to be featured. And that's why I, I put it out there. And uh, let's drop the formalities. Kirby, why don't you just uh, address me as Daryl, my Thank given name. Thank you. All right. Listen, um, one of the questions that came to you from your uh, highly enlightened audience, I must say, and, and you do have a very active Twitter presence, and I've seen that you've built out your your uh, authorship um, enterprise into an incredible array of related social media. But one of the questions that came to you was, were Ghislaine Maxwell's parent, grandparents spies? Is she a multi-generational spy, Ghislaine Maxwell? Drum roll. You're going to be the first person and your audience is the first person to hear this answer. And the answer is yes. Ghislaine Maxwell is a third generation spy. So not only was her father, Robert Maxwell, a spy, and in fact, I've got names for you later from MI6, uh, who helped him with his business. So you, you had an inkling, but I have names today to give you. 
and I have information about Betty Maxwell and her parents. So may I begin? Because this is going to blow everybody's socks off. Please, please okay. begin. Yes. Okay, I won't, I won't keep you guys waiting too no, long. No, I'm on, I'm on uh, tenterhooks here. Go ahead. Okay, so Betty Maxwell, who was born in, uh, it's sort of like, a, I think her birthday, I have it here. I've got 29 pages of notes for you. Um, I just want to get everything perfect. Um, Betty Maxwell uh, was born in 1921. Her parents were Louis Paul Maynard and Colomb. Her maiden name was Petel Maynard. Now, Paul Maynard uh, did not really marry uh, his wife until he was in his early 40s and she was eight years younger. What's interesting and what I was able to dig up is that um, Paul Maynard used to um, romp around with Mata Hari. And as we know, Mata Hari was a spy who was pretty much, she was jailed, right? And she was cavorting and, and passing around secrets. Uh, but um, Betty Maxwell in her uh, memoir writes that her father um, would, sort of tell the children, her and her sister, uh, whose name was Yvonne and who the family called Vani, who was a few years older than Betty, that he would regale the children with tales of his affairs with the very well-known ladies of the Belle Epoque. And among these was Mata Hari, the exotic dancer and alleged spy. Now, according again to Betty Maxwell, she states that Mata Hari was so in love with her dashing and handsome father. And I will tell you how, how one looks at one's father perhaps through rose colored glasses, but that, that Mata Hari was so in love with her father that she would write him love letters using her married name, Mrs. McLeod. Well, before I move on to the very hot stuff, I just wanna say that her father, you know, there are photos that one can find of her father. He had, you know, a rather round face. He had what was called in those days, the, um, I think it's called the toothbrush mustache that was uh, adopted by Adolf Hitler. And he was, you know, somewhat bald. So, as a woman, I looked at this photograph of this dashing and handsome man. I could hardly wait to see him because I'm like, oh my God, this is going to be a very handsome man. And I found, oh no, he's not. But he seems to have been connected to some really interesting things, Mata Hari being among them. The mother, Galen Maxwell's maternal grandmother is the one that we really want to pay attention to. So she was according to Betty Maxwell, a very plain woman, the homebody, but this homebody was a spy. So the, um, the very first, um, we live in the sort of the, 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 the an advanced techn technological age where our, our phones are a camera, a recording device. We, our phones nowadays do what these spies in those days would have loved them to do. However, the, the first um, spying and surveillance was not just the carrier pigeon, but it was the telephone. So during World War I, Colomb, under the instruction of, and this name is very important and everyone should remember it. He was Henry Philippe, Peyton, and he was her superior. He was an older, decorated military man who I will get back to uh, momentarily. Under his command, uh, she worked during World War I, Colomb. She was a telephone supervisor. In her role as a telephone supervisor, she passed on information about the enemy positions 
to army headquarters. And so therefore she was risking her life had she been caught. She was decorated by um, this very well-known Marshal Peyton. And um, she, after the war, she theoretically went back to life as normal. However, during World War II, she was called back to duty. Now, during World War II, the Germans occupied France. Uh, Adolf Hitler, uh, most people are unaware, was in love with France. Uh, and so what he did was he made a, a, an unofficial visit. It was not, and this is not it, it necessarily in my book. I just want to give people a background of, of, of France at that time and, and Hitler's relationship with France. And so what he did was he um, made this unannounced visit with, with you know, his troops. He went to the Eiffel Tower and because of the war, the cables had been cut uh, so that he couldn't ride up and down the way you and I would if we were in Paris. But um, he, he marveled at the sights of Paris and he really loved it. Now, when he went back to Germany, of course, his, his men took over. And as you know, they were in the business of killing Jews. Um, well, what, what does Colomb, uh, Galen Maxwell's grandmother and the mother of Betty Maxwell do? She is called back to service under this Henri Philippe Peyton. Who, who is the head of what is the puppet government in France. And this is in my book, Galen Maxwell, an unauthorized biography. She is called back uh, to serve, but this time for the Nazis. And she is put back in the position of, a of, of being in charge of a telephone service on the senior level. So she was a spy and she's spying this time not for the citizens of France, but she is spying for Adolf Hitler. What makes this chilling, ch chilling, I mean, I literally had to take a day off my research when I found this because I, it was very difficult for me to absorb it, you know, because it hits you in a very vis vis visceral way. So I had to go back and, 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 and listen to some, a um, commentary by some professors at Yale that you can find on YouTube about the war and about how the French people felt about Jews because, you know, there were Jews in France that I didn't think it was such a, an anti-Semitic uh, country. But to my surprise, I discovered that it was an anti-Semitic country that in fact, Galen Maxwell's grandparents were anti-Semitic and that this, the, the head of uh, the Nazis um, puppet government in France, Henri Peyton, was even a, a harsher anti-Semite than, than uh, Hitler. And if that can be imagined. So while he was given the orders of how to it's hard for me to say this because it's just an emotional thing of how to torture people. He took that to the next level. So he tortured more harder. He sent so many people to the gas chambers. Uh, after the war, he was found guilty of treason. Well, who, and he's supposed to be shot. Other people were shot, found guilty of treason. You have now killed all of these innocent people, okay? So they, they were being rounded up and he was rounded up. And at that time he was 80 years old. Well, who appealed for his release? Queen Mary, connected to Prince, Phil, Prince Andrew, isn't that, huh? Edward VIII, the Duke of Windsor who abdicated the throne to go marry the twice divorced American Wallace Simpson. And who else? President of the United States, Harry Truman. It was Harry Truman, 
I know that you know this, who was the person who sanctioned Operation Paperclip. Operation Paperclip was the covert intelligence program where while the records state that it was 1600 German scientists, engineers, and others that were moved out of Nazi Germany into the United States, some of them were given positions in NASA and in Ivy League universities, that number can be three times as high. Um, so I'm gonna just let you say something because if this is a lot to, I think a lot to absorb in one fell swoop. How do you feel about what I just said? That's an incredible story. Most people, including myself and to not that long ago, thought that Vichy France, that is France under the German occupation was that there was a Nazi on every corner with a Mauser pointing at their head. But no, as you correctly characterized, Paris was uh, an oasis. I mean, you had world-class philosophers like Jean-Paul Sartre, who was able to go to the Café d'Anton or Café Fleur, or wherever he, he did his writing. And he was able to write these incredible uh, pieces of uh, drama, theater, and philosophy, all under the Third Reich. So for those who were collaborators, such as Colomb, as it appears to be, life was uh, not that uh, not that difficult. If you were a Jew or one of the proscribed people, that's a different story. And I know you're going to get into it uh, later, but um, the daughter of uh, Cologne was able to even uh, enroll in the uh, Sorbonne during in, in the midst of the war. So and but my main takeaway point at this at, at this time is that it seems to be you're leading to this uh, this notion that there's a direct historical line that connects the days of Cologne. She's the matriarch of the family, and I think it's really the women in, in this story that that are the the forces behind this the scene the hand that rocks the cradle proverbially right but there's a direct line that connects that uh time frame that particular point in history to what's going on in 2021 2022 is that correct well look um robert maxwell was indeed a spy i'm gonna just take a step back because i did listen to one of your podcasts and you um, astutely were wondering about uh, Robert Maxwell's connection to Springer. So I did the research for you. <laughs> and uh, in 1946, uh, Robert Maxwell, who had already begun during the war because of the fact that he had been promoted um, and, and, and was fierce. He had, you know, he was young. He joined the service at the age of 16. He was at, on the battlefield from year 16, and he's on the battlefield for a long time. He was became known as, um, I believe it was almost like, it, it, was, it was considered a derogatory term. I think it was called um, murderer Maxwell, something. He was just, and, and you know, he was using a lot of aliases and and all of that, but he was known to shoot on the spot. In fact, had he not died in 1991, he was going to be arrested for having killed uh, the uh, mayor of a town uh, in cold blood during the war. So he was, while he was considered a war hero, right before he died, whether he was pushed or fell off the Lady Galen yacht on November 5th of 1991, uh, the authorities were building a case against him as, you know, as, as a, a war criminal. So, however, um, because of the fact that he, during that time was considered, uh, he had risen in rank, he started to do business with some of the local businessmen who could not get their work out of Germany. And one of these was Ferdinand Springer. And so initially, what he was doing was just sort of lending a hand and charging money, right, to sort of, okay, you, you need to get paper to come into the country, I can get paper for you. You need to get your, your, your material out of the country, I can do this for you. But very quickly, he decides that 
I'm not going to do this for money. I want to be your partner. So in 1946, he begins a, a working partnership with this German publisher who happened to be Jewish and he survived the, the war. Um, and, but instead of calling it Springer Maxwell, he calls it Maxwell Springer. Okay, so he put his name first. This is a family that, by the way, that had been, they had been in, a, in publishing for a very long time, you know, many, like almost 100 years by this point. They, that was their family business. But no, Maxwell went in there and called it Maxwell Springer. By 1948, he then merged Maxwell Springer with Butterworth Press in London. Guess what? Butterworth Press in London had ties to MI6. Names. <laughs> I know you like facts, so I have names for you. <laughs> KGB Chief Leonard, I'm going to spell it L-E-O-N-I-D, okay? So Leonid, Le how, how would I pronounce that? Leonid, as in Leonid Brezhnev. Okay, okay, and then this name, Shebarskin, so Leonid S. H E B A R S H I N. How would you pronounce that? Uh, just as you did, Shabarskin. I think he's Russian. There's a lot of Ukrainians that are involved in the Maxwell story, but in this uh, case, I think he's yeah. straight up Russian. Oh, well, yeah. So he confirmed that, yes, they, they hired uh, Maxwell as a Russian spy. What for? For that. Springer work that he was doing, the scientific journals, and for what purpose? <laughs> to a dual purpose, to flip some of the scientists, to have them become spies. Nobody has ever gone there. Nobody has ever done this kind of work. Nobody has ever found that out. To flip these uh, scientists to become spies, and also. You did mention this in one of your shows to steal the work that they had done, right? But primarily it was to steal. Now, the other, uh, what he was doing concurrently with this, that people seem to think that, oh no, I've heard so many people say, no, Maxwell was not in my six. Well, yes, he was. And I'm going to tell you who, who Desmond Bristow. A quote from Desmond Bristow, who is now a dead. Sorry about that, folks. You can't call him up, but I've got stuff in my book that you can you can follow the breadcrumbs that I leave you. He he was in, in charge of um, MI6 in London. And I have a quote from him. Well, Maxwell would be recruiting people, interrogating people, see what their scientific views were. We decided we could use him. He, he was doing odd things. Maxwell had been spotted in post-world Berlin. And then Maxwell, he suggested that we subsidize him in the book business. We helped him in the form of buying his business. This is Desmond Bristow from MI6. And so in response to him making this statement, the question was posed to him, well, did MI6 ever uh, buy a business or invest with any of your other spies? No, that's the only time in my career that we've ever done that with anyone. And he was good for us, you know, so they fronted the money for Maxwell to go into business, which of course takes us to Betty Maxwell. <laughs> and did she know? What do you think, Daryl? <laughs> Surprise me, Kirby. Surprise. Your book is so full of surprises. But I should state, as, as ladies and gentlemen, as, as Kirby Summers is alluding to, uh, Robert Maxwell was exfiltrating all this incredible cutting edge research. Uh, you've, everybody's heard about Operation Paperclip or Project Paperclip by now, right? Ad nauseum. But this, uh, no one, very few people know that it was a, there was a flow going east, that is to the Soviet Union. And that's what Robert Maxwell was doing. It's not, uh, it was Operation Pierogi or something, but it, it's not paperclip, but, but something tantamount to, to paperclip was going on. 
uh, intellectual labor, right, scientists, and as well as uh, the research that was being brokered and housed by this eminent uh, Berlin, I think was their headquarters, this eminent uh, family publishing concern called the Splinninge Verlag, which by the way is still in existence. Please well, what, continue. What, what they do today, uh, just as an added bonus, is I did a little research into what they did today for you because I, I so admire your work. And they're into artificial intelligence in a big way, which is what we can now loop Jeffrey Epstein and Glenn Maxwell into. We can loop Bill Gates into that. So, but I'm going to go back to Robert Maxwell and Betty Maxwell. So while uh, Betty Maxwell writes this memoir, which I literally had to read two times because I read it first, trying to believe her. Then I had to sit down and read it. And you know, it's a big book <laughs> and it's not well-written. It's a little on the boring side. It's very dry and it's very self. I don't like books where people are too self-involved, you know? But it, she came across as the lady doth protest too much. <laughs> and so I had to go, I had to go back and say, well, you know, she has always been described by the people who worked for Robert Maxwell, by his editors, and by those in their social circle as the long suffering, loyal, and innocent wife of the ruthless crook Maxwell. Now, I don't know if, if the audience knows that her two sons, um, Kevin and Ian, were arrested after Robert Maxwell uh, fell or was pushed off his yacht in 1991 for the crimes committed by the father. Uh, and oddly enough, you know, they were arrested, but and they pled they had no money so that the court had to give them court appointed attorneys. Well, for three years, this lawsuit, uh, sorry, it's not a lawsuit, it's a fe it's, it's, it's investigation. And at the end of it, they're allowed to go home. Oh, well, gee, that sounds like Robert Maxwell going into Sandia Laboratories in 1984, selling them a compromised version of Promise, stealing the nuclear secrets of the United States. Two scientists are very alarmed. They contact the FBI. They open an investigation, and before you know, an investigation is closed. Robert Maxwell is never bothered, even though there's a long-standing concern from the 1950s uh, by uh, Edgar J. J. Edgar Hoover that, of course, he's a spy, but if nothing happens to him. But Betty Maxwell, in her book, she sounded almost like she had no money. You know, she, you know, it, it, it went on and on sort of as you know, my, my children, had it not been for my children, I could not have survived. I, I Robert Max, you know, Robert was not a spy. And, and that caught my attention because one of the first people to pre-order my, my book on Ghislaine Maxwell, Ghislaine Maxwell, an unauthorized biography, was Isabel Maxwell. Now, Isabel Maxwell <laughs> purchased um, Robert Maxwell, Israel Super Spy, written by one of your friends who is no longer with us, uh, Gordon Thomas, and his writing partner, Martin Dillon. What she did was she was living in San Francisco at the time. She gets onto an air. She, oh, so the book is not published yet, Robert Maxwell, uh, Israel Super Spy. It's theoretically just with the publisher. Isabel manages to get a copy of it. She hops on a plane from San Francisco. She goes to Israel where she sits down with, with the prime minister and the head of the Mossad. And they're trying to figure out how to get this book not to be published. Well, they didn't succeed in not having it published, but what, what they did succeed in was Alan Dershowitz was called in because Alan Dershowitz has always been a, an asset of the Mossad. Uh, and if you need more proof, uh, read my books. Uh, but I've been saying this for at least 20 years. Um, 
uh, they called Alan Dershowitz in and, and, and neither your friend who is now deceased, he was such a, a gifted and wonderful writer, Gordon Thomas, or Martin Dillon, who is one of my social media friends, um, knew at the time that Alan Dershowitz had any anything to do with their lives or knew anything about Jeffrey Epstein or Galen Maxwell at the time. So that Alan Dershowitz is given by mainstream media, obviously, as much space as he needs to write a scathing, scathing review of the book, their book, so that nobody bought it in the United States. So essentially in the United States, they made that book disappear. They're doing the same with mine by leaving bad reviews, but everybody can see through their shenanigans at this point. So Betty Maxwell um, pretends to sort of not know what's going on with her husband. How does she not know this? Those beginning businesses that I discussed with uh, that happened during the war, guess whose name was on those documents? It wasn't just Robert Maxwell that became the partner to, <laughs> to all of these little businesses that he created uh, to, uh, what is it, Springer, right? Yeah, for it none. He added his wife's name to almost every document. And there were some companies that he would just, he, by the end of the, like the, I forget how many years, I think it was either one or two years, he had a hundred employees and had already gone through sort of you, the same thing that Michelle and Rickless did. You buy a company, right? Or you absorb it you get rid of the assets. And there were no laws on the books in those days. So that Betty Maxwell and he were going through company after company, taking the assets and shutting it down, bankrupt, 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 bankrupt. So how does Betty Maxwell not know that her husband has been working for um, both MI6 and the KGB? She would have to have earplugs, uh, you know, have her, si her eyes covered and not be in the same house with a man that she had nine children with. That would be impossible. Um, so in 1988, for example, she is now being known as a woman who was very much into the Holocaust, which I initially thought was very admirable. Wow, I mean, that's pretty cool. She does this, you know, she recreated the family that he lost in the war. I did not know that her parents were anti-Semites at the time, but if you look at what, um, what Maxwell was doing in 1988, and I have this note here, so bear with me for one minute. Um, in 1988, Bob was busy um, laundering money for the Russian mob. So, at the same time that she is having these conferences, Holocaust conferences, famed, renowned. They, there were three of them, um, but he was, and I think you, you will know this name when I, when I tell you his name. So in, in, in 1988, when Robert Maxwell was obtaining an Israeli passport for Simeon Mogilevich, I think that's how to pronounce his name, along with another 23 for his associates, Betty introduced him to Samuel Passar. Well, except that Simeon Mogilevich is considered the biggest mobster in all of Russia. He has, he sells children, right, in sex. He's, he, he's, he is the boss of bosses. I mean, you've heard of his name. You, you, you must have, right? So while, it, so there's just no way that Betty does not know. And it made me look at her and I have to regrettably call it a front, her front of being a, a Holocaust survivor, a, sort of someone who wants to bring awareness to the world. I had to look at that as a front because you cannot be doing this while your husband is a criminal running around with, with, with the biggest gangsters on the planet who are 
stealing from Jews. What they were doing at the time was the Jewish people were trying to uh, move uh, into Israel and the United States. Well, what they were doing was they were taking their belongings, telling them, hey, we're going to sell this market price and pocketing the money. Hello. Sounds very much like the George Soros, his father, their, their particular entrepreneurial uh, business model, expropriating fellow Jews. Yeah. And so, it, you know, we have to remember that Robert Maxwell ultimately was a very selfish person. We see that in his daughter, Ghislaine Maxwell. She's she at no point has she uh, shown any sign of remorse for her actions. Uh, the same thing can be said about Betty Maxwell. There was no sign of remorse. Uh, she simply basically, she was going to get a divorce from him before he died. And then she ended up, you know, sort of becoming this grieving widow. Well, you go from <laughs> you're going to get a divorce, but suddenly you're the grieving. There just seems to be a lot of hypocrisy. Uh, that didn't jive with uh, the way normal people would behave. Yeah. Normal people like you and me, Kirby, it's very difficult to wrap our minds around the degree of cynicism that both Robert Maxwell and Betty Maxwell exhibit. Imagine exploiting the memory, the painful memory, the reality of the Holocaust uh, and writing her, her biography and her history in such a way to make her out and her husband to be a, a humanitarian, a hero, a heroine, exploiting the memory of uh, Jews that were sent away and expropriated and murdered on a massive scale. Uh, but a family like that, individuals, characters who come from that uh, bloodline, from that family tree, they're capable of anything so far as I'm concerned, including the complete rewriting of the human genetic code, including being intimately involved with developing the most sophisticated biological weapons to be deployed against not just Jews this time, but the entire population of planet Earth. Yeah, they're, they're not nice people. Um, there is a concerted effort on the part of the Maxwell family to deny that Robert Maxwell was a spy. So that was the reason that Isabel Maxwell wanted to stop uh, Robert Maxwell Israel Super Spy, the book by Gordon Thomas and Martin Dillon from being uh, printed. However, um, Isabel Maxwell has given interviews throughout the years since her father died, basically poo-pooing the idea that her father was a spy uh, one of Ian Maxwell's friends has written a book about Robert Maxwell, again, saying, oh, maybe, maybe he was at the beginning of, you know, at the beginning, at the end of World War II, but there's no way he was at the end. Well, that's not true. Robert Maxwell was a spy until the very end. Um, so that uh, there, there's just this concerted effort to make it look like they're not spies. And the more... You know, the more a person for us who we're all watching this very closely because this is the spy case of our lifetime, right? This is this is the spy case of the more they push, the more it makes people like you and I look closer, which is how I came up with. I got I got to go a, 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 a generation before this and see what was going on there and then to find out, oh, OK. And the, the other thing about her father that I forgot to mention, and it could be the reason that Robert Maxwell decided to, he proposed during the lunchtime when he met her for the first time. Now, Betty Maxwell is not a stunning beauty. I've been proposed to on lunch, but I'm a stunning beauty. But Betty Maxwell is not a stunning beauty. So, but her father claimed Oh, it's just, this is just too juicy. I, I just wish I could just talk about this all day long. Her Please. father, <laughs> okay, her father claimed, let me just find the note. Cause I've got, like I said, I've got all these pages. Um, but for you, I knew I had to come with something special. 
Well, also, okay. I'd like to, you were speaking of uh, your audience, your highly engaged audience. I want to make a note at this point, maybe you'll address it later, but um, you were telling me that your second largest uh, customer base is not in an English speaking country, although the educated people do speak English, and that is Japan. And I was astounded by that. Well, it's happened. It's not a consistent thing. It's happened twice where most of the people who, and because I could look at, I could look, um, I could look at the the demographics in uh, from various places. I can see them on my website, for example. But in, in particular, I can see who's buying the books on Amazon because Amazon will give me a breakdown of countries. And so the first time that it happened uh, was several months ago, and um, I began to I, I made a tweet about it, and suddenly everybody. And I, and I had to remember, and I was like, oh, Japan, Joey Ito, right, MIT. So I, I went and I, and I tweeted about it. And of course, I had um, the person who worked underneath Joey Ito reach out to me to tell me that he was only following instructions and that, you know, he was not to blame. And I made an adjustment to my book at the time because he had given me the statement I wanted to at least put it on the record that this came from him so that Joey Ito, as you know, um, was accepting money from Jeffrey Epstein and also from Bill Gates under mysterious um, uh, orders, you know, just don't say where the money comes from. But then last month, and I think um, I sent you an email, I said, hey, Japan is second again. And so uh, you and I are both kind of like digging into it. And I told you, let me just keep working on it because the way I work is I dig deep. I go beneath the layers of the layers. And so, yeah, there's something else happening. But what ended up happening with Joey Ito was he was being considered. Now, Japan is a very proud country. They have an emperor. They're, uh, they've been around forever. So I was just stunned that Joey Ito was being given a, 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 a specific special made position as, you know, for, for the internet. And I thought, wait, so once I started tweeting, they took that away from him. He didn't get it. The and, offer you know, with, was withdrawn? It was withdrawn, yes. Hello, hello thank you for me because I did that. <laughs> Ito, thank me. <laughs> well, <But> anyway. <laughs> you, you were too modest to, to take uh, credit for it, but I attribute the fact that you changed the course of Japanese and world history by your reportage. So ladies well, and gentlemen, this is important work. But they, they went back and they gave him something else, which <laughs> I'll soon be ridding him of because mm. I will be connecting Ito to one of your friends' uh, exposés of 2002, and but please let me finish the, the the research on that, and I'll come back and we mm -hmm. can dish on Ito all we want. And You're Japan, alluding to Yoichi Shimatsu. Yes, he did okay. really good work, mm -hmm. and but I'm I'm trying to make sure that there's that all the that you know all the layers are covered. Um, so, but so it's getting back to um. Betty's father, Paul, for a minute, he, he, he claimed was he was a descendant from the kings of France through uh, Robert D'Anjou. And so the, the last name would be D apostrophe A-N-J-O-U. So um, he, during his lifetime, uh, it, he was in the 1300s. So he was known as Robert the Wise, King of Naples, the King of Jerusalem, and the Count of Provence from, 19, from 1309 to 1343. And so upon his father's accession to the throne in 1309, he became the Duke of Calabria. Now, while there were no other accounts to substantiate Betty's claims about her father being the descendant of the royal family of France, guess what happened? 
it even in her obituary because there you know when she died there were several newspapers who wrote obituaries and they write in the way that they're going to have a footnote as to what they're quoting so they quoted this that her you know her 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 father was the blah blah and i'm like okay where does this originate from and i traced it to one of these online uh you know, you can find your family tree on one of these online websites. Well, guess what? It was wiped off the face of the earth after Jeffrey Epstein's death in 2019. Hmm. So after Jeffrey Epstein died in August of 2019, why does, why, you know, one has to wonder, right? Why does Betty Maxwell, why does her history have to be wiped off the internet? and off of the ancestry records. Isn't that odd? Quite. I, I think I'm shocking you and you're you're not even Well, shocked. you know, <laughs> my suspicion is that there are some uh, Templar bloodlines, the uh, Templar Knights, given the fact that their, their family comes from that region. These people were always fighting against the central government and they were also uh, in uh, mortal uh, deathly combat against the Church of Rome. Uh, I think there might also be a right-wing uh, Catholic um, subplot here. It might be the major plot, really. Well, I'll part tell of the you, Maxwell there, story. Yeah, there, there's there are a lot of interesting things, and and I did hear you uh, discuss, um, and I don't know if this is the right terminology for it because I haven't really gone down the rabbit hole, but I did find something of a rabbit hole with Betty Maxwell, which I'd like to. Um, share with you and your audience but you talked about satanism in, in some manner and while that's not really talked about that often in the epstein case i can say that i have come across it talking to to victims but betty maxwell had an interesting um experience and i would like to read you this excerpt from my book about Met betty maxwell and the devil May I do that? Please. <laughs> I'm sorry to keep laughing. It's just that this is too delicious. Okay. So let me find here. So she has, um, this is before she marries uh, Robert Maxwell. This is during the time that I think just before she begins her studies at the Sorbonne. Um, she is with one of her cousins, uh, the youngest son of her mother's eldest brother, who, by the way, was a priest, and he died in a very strange drowning accident. Um, so they uh, would often go to the National Gallery to view the early Flemish paintings, and he would take the time to explain the details to her. So um, she writes, one day he had been examining a particular virgin and child for ages and I was getting tired so I sat down on one of the narrow bench-like settees which were then situated on one of the narrow bench-like which were then situated in one of the narrow hallways uh, as soon as I sat down an extremely unpleasant man dressed all in black rather weird looking and disquieting came to sit beside me I remember feeling so uncomfortable and so cold all of a sudden that I got up and walked the few paces which separated me from my cousin, who was still lost in contemplation of the picture. I'm joining you because I'm frightened of the man sitting next to me, I said, but when we both turned to look at him, there was no sign, no sign of him. I just could not believe my eyes. We had a good view of the entire length of the gallery in both directions, and there was nobody who fitted my description. I felt so ill at ease and embarrassed as I tried to explain that there really had been someone there. I was sure that Fernand would think I was mistaken and make fun of me. On the contrary, with complete composure, he said, don't worry, it's the devil. He's always pestering me, take no notice. Betty Maxwell was never able to erase that memory uh, of what happened that day. And she claims that from that moment on, 
she experienced similar encounters. That was wow. startling. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think uh, Betty Maxwell had the second sight. She's underplaying it, but she did have the uh, the gift of second sight. And uh, I attribute this to the family connection to Paris, where it was the hotbed, especially of the Belle Epoque, uh, the late 19th century, uh, occultism, especially uh, Rosicrucian. And you mentioned that Isabella was, was in San Francisco for a time. Well, guess where the U.S. headquarters of the Rosicrucian Society is located? Right in the heart of Mossad Valley. It's, we call it Silicon Valley. Uh, the, wow. Yeah, the headquarters of the Rosicrucians is in San Jose or San Jose, California. I've been there. Really, that's, that's where they are? That's right. That's such that's, a cute town. Yes, and that's Silicon Valley. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, all of this smells um, of uh, just espionage. Uh, the case itself has been handled in a very bizarre way. Um, Glenn Maxwell was arrested on July the 2nd of 2020. Um, she was never, she never requested a plea deal, nor did the prosecution offer her a plea deal. Um, however, they they put in motion after motion after motion after motion to this judge, Nathan, Allison Nathan, who, by the way, was just promoted by President Joe Biden to the Second Circuit, which is one level beneath the Supreme Court. And um, in the middle of this trial, she takes a three-day holiday <laughs> without telling anybody where she's going. So the the whole trial is stopped. She goes to Washington, D.C. to make sure she still has this promotion, which I, in my opinion, I look at it as a pre-thank you for handling this Glenn Maxwell trial in a certain way. She goes back to the trial. And, um, but um, all of these motions, it's not normal. Uh, the way the, the law works and the way judges work is you get one motion, you, you respond to it, you get a second motion, you slap their hand, whoever's putting in a second motion, and you say, that's it, I'm done. But for some reason, everything that Glenn Maxwell has done with the court system has been unusual. So they filed, I think, shy of 10 motions. That's a lot of motions. They requested bail at least six times. That's very unusual. Um, Glenn Maxwell is allowed to hug her attorneys and her sister and her brother in court in a display to show the jury, I am sure, that she is not a demon or a spy or a rapist, but she is a, her, a person. Well, you know, the things that are just happening, and I try to explain to people, listen, I know you don't want to hear this, but the prosecution the defense and the judge, they're all on the same side. It's us that we're on a different side. <laughs> we're on the side of we would like some justice, but the, the, the whole thing is a sham and it is a, it, it's rather heartbreaking for a lot of people who believed in the system. We have a system. Yeah, we have a system for the very rich and especially for the very rich who have operated a trafficking, uh, uh, you know, like the Franklin scandal, like the finders who have operated a trafficking scheme uh, that's connected to intelligence. And, you know, I can talk more about Mossad and the CIA and the MI6 connection if you want, but um, if you have any specific questions about the trial, I'll be happy to answer. Now, I know you live nearby. Is this, this is uh, being the trials conducted what, in the Southern District, New York? Yes, here in New York, yes. Okay, it's quite a scene there. Have you been down, down there? Uh, well, I have my, my own spies because I don't want to, to be uh, attacked by Isabel Maxwell. <laughs> okay, I understand. <laughs> and uh, by all of her. I'm sure there's lots of people out on the street. Well, actually, that's the problem. Uh, the only people that are on the street are advocates, 
some of my followers, not a lot because not a lot of people could travel here. Uh, in mainstream media, Julie K. Brown, who wrote a, a perversion of justice for the Miami Herald, which by the way, only focused on the victims in Palm Beach, right? So that's just a sliver of the story. It doesn't cover Paris. It doesn't cover the Virgin Islands. It doesn't cover New Mexico. It doesn't cover New York. Uh, Julie Brown was there for a few days. Um, the, the case was supposed to be heard up, you know, four weeks for the prosecution, two weeks for the defense. It was cut in half, two weeks for the prosecution. And the, then the defense had maybe four days when Ghislaine Maxwell was, was given the opportunity to take the stand and defend herself. She was very arrogant. She stood up and she told the judge, the prosecution has not uh, prepared a, a defense that would that is beyond a reasonable doubt. So I don't see any reason why I should take the stand. I mean, that alone would make a regular jury. I say this woman is, is guilty as hell. Um, but, and so there have been, there have been several requests from the jury who is deliberating as we speak um, to see additional information from the judge. Uh, but, you know, I have, I don't have a great feeling. Uh, let's look at the history. Bill Cosby was allowed to go home. H Harvey Weinstein, who with Rose McGowan, that's where the Me Too movement got some push. However, Harvey Weinstein, as we speak, is going to be allowed to post bail and get out of jail and await his trial in California at home. And the charges were taken up to the Supreme Court and he is getting all of those charges removed. What's gonna happen with Ghislaine Maxwell who really is intelligence? Even if she gets, let's say they, they say, oh, you're gonna be put in jail for 10 years, 20 years, because theoretically the charges are anywhere from if she's told that she's guilty, if she's found to be guilty of all charges, she should be in jail for 40 to 80 years. However, what the SDNY has done in the past, even with high profile um, drug kingpins, which you and I know work for the CIA when they're needed, uh, they give them a very high sentence when it's the media are paying attention. And then three months later, there's this tiny little paragraph somewhere in some obscure newspaper, oh, he was released. <laughs> You know, the, the sentence, so I, I, I see if even if something were to happen where she is sentenced, I, I, of course, they'll appeal it, but I just see something odd happening. Like, I know that Donald Trump was going to give her a preemptive pardon, and he was talked out of it because, remember, he wished her well. He wished her well because he has a long history with her father, Robert Maxwell. He knows her for a very long time. She has a lot of the secrets that he would like not to be told. So he did wish her well, and he was going to pardon her uh, just before he left office. And the only reason he did not pardon her was because he was advised that the states would then individually go after her. So to help her, he didn't pardon her. But what people do not understand is that Donald Trump also knows our current president, Joe Biden and Bill Clinton. These guys, they all, they're all friends and they know the same people and they're controlled by the same, by the same, let's call it group. Um, are there initials CIA, which stands for Catholics in Action? I mean, I don't who, want to cast aspersions who, on, on the Roman who, Catholic religion. Who, are, who yeah. are really, they're really controlled by Mossad, mm -hmm. but um, CIA does have sort of like a, I hate to call it this, but it's sort of like a blood, uh, 
you know, when you're kids, you make this little blood pact with, with your best friend, you know, whatever. They, they do look the other way. And, but the reason they look the other way is because their presidents and the, the, the people who sit in Congress and the people who are in positions of power uh, are blackmailed. And so they look the other way because they have no choice. They're sworn brothers. They take the blood oath. Yeah, and, and then they partake of having sex with children or having sex, you know, it wasn't just children, it was boys, it wasn't just girls, it was boys. Um, it was, they would literally put out a catalog. Uh, mm -hmm. So for example, when Prince Andrew uh, met with Virginia Giuffre, at the time she was known as Virginia Roberts, uh, Ghislaine Maxwell had indeed sent him photographs of her um, in not so many, I, mean, I can't really get into what Virginia and I have possibly discussed, but, um, and that's how it's done, you know, it, it, mm. like the Victoria's Secret catalog, you could hire, you can get yourself a mistress uh, or a wife or a sex slave from the Victoria's Secret catalog. Well, that's uh, what Prince did. Prince, what did, the singer. Oh, what did he do? Well, uh, one of the women, um, Sylvia Massey is her name. She's on uh, YouTube. She talks about how Prince, while he was having some downtime uh, recording some of his masterpieces, would whip out the Victoria's catalogs uh, and make his selection. So she tells this story. She thought it was really bizarre. Well, so it's that it's, just amplifies what you're what you're. Yeah, addressing. it's more common than um, most people know. I mean, the this ring interconnects with other rings. So we have then the situation of Jean-Luc Brunel in Paris, who was a funnel of young models to Jeffrey Epstein. But then we have somebody like uh, Karen Mulder, who was a, a high fashion model in the 1990s, who on television, on French television, and this is in my book, in 2001, told a startled audience and an even more startled host that she was a sex slave, that she was part of um, a, a, a trafficking ring, that they turned her into a prostitute, that they turned her into a drug addict, that she was given to uh, Prince Albert of Monaco and they shut the production down. And then uh, they put her into an insane asylum for five months under heavy drugs. Uh, it, 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 so that this has been ongoing for decades and, and it interconnects and it's all part of the same thing and it's and it's and it's protected and that's why Jeffrey Epstein was able to do this for 30 years uh, and the only reason that he's gone was so that we could forget about it the mm -hmm. trial is a mock trial so that when it's done we can all go home and resume our normal lives it's it's uh, and so that they can continue this, which happened began long time before Jeffrey Epstein, and continues uh, outside the borders that we've been made aware of. Mm -hmm. It's a three dimensional Netflix, it gives us a fake uh, catharsis. Um, but Kirby, uh, I don't know if you've given this much thought, but since you live in the fashion capital of the United States, if not the world. And a lot of this story centers upon Paris, which was the capital of uh, haute couture, right? Going back to Coco Chanel, who was sleeping with a German uh, Wehrmacht officers during the occupation, as we all know by now. What is the connection of the uh, high fashion haute couture uh, in this story here? You have someone who comes from, again, from a publishing family, Anna Wintour, uh, American slash British, who's been the head of the Condé Nast uh, magazine publishing syndicate and is the fashion maven. And she's been satirized to a certain degree in the, the Devil Wears Prada, both the book and the film. But it seems to me that uh, Haute Couture or even Off the Rack, uh, Victoria's Secret, most of that stuff is made in China, but it seems like the whole fashion industry is an integral part of this story that you're on the deep story that you're uncovering. Do you have any comments about that? Uh, I have many models. I have uh, many comments. Stephanie Seymour, Jacques, uh, Jean-Luc well, Brunel, and all these other characters. 
have spoken in some of your in some of your uh, podcasts about mind conditioning and the fashion industry is about mind conditioning. So to give you an example, uh, Leslie Wexner, who is the owner of L Brands under which that umbrella, he, he had um, Victoria's Secret, Abercrombie and Fitch um, and a host of other uh, companies in addition to the company that he purchased from the Shillam Rickless uh, which was the learner shops. He bought 500 learner shops from him. Uh, he was through Abercrombie, Ab, you know, I'm having a hard time because I'm a little tired, but A&E, so A&F, uh, through that, the catalogs were even more risque. They featured um, nude young teenagers and they would be sent out regularly to uh, a, 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 a sort of a, a hidden audience, but also what he was doing at the same time. And there was a, a Lieutenant Governor by the name of Corrine Wood, who I write about in Jeffrey Epstein's Predator Spy. What he was doing was also selling underwear to five-year-old little girls. So when you start selling clothing and you create a um, sort of like a Barbie doll, doll image for children to start wearing un sexy underwear, basically saying you know, the adults can't have all the fun or, or just, just it had really horrific uh, for, for a child, you know, to be wearing and to be groomed from. So his role was to groom uh, the children that eventually grew up to be then easily taken into the sex trafficking and to be exploited. So when Corrine Wood tried to, she, she created a boycott website uh, to bring awareness to the fact that Leslie Wexner was uh, doing all of these things that were really horrific for not only the youth, but for children, what happened to her website? It became a porn website. It was, it was taken over by a porn site. And Wexner has had everything that was ever written about it removed from the internet. And the only reason I know this is because I've been researching Wexner as uh, in connection with Ira Rickless, who was the man who turned me into his sex slave for many years, for three decades. So I know everything he's done. And, 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 and uh, so it's a form of mind control. The fashion industry, uh, everybody, uh, these magazines make young women want to look like the people in the magazine, the models. They make them want to become these models. And so you have this cycle of evergreen, new, uh, vulnerable, and insecure uh, children slash vulnerable women uh, to put through, through put you know, to feed into the machine, which is always looking for victims. Does that make sense? Uh, it does, but then you have people, these miscreants such as Roman Polanski, who identifies as French, I think he's a French national, he says, well, that's just part of our culture. What's part of our culture? Like Having sex with 13 years. Yes, exactly. And of course, well, he has supporters all the way up to superstars like Meryl Streep. This is Roman Polanski we're talking about. Yeah, yeah. Well, Roman Polanski, um, don't forget, he did Rosemary's Baby and he did a, a couple of other really interesting and uh, films that should be uh, examined very closely. Um, Elvis Presley married a 14-year-old girl, remember? I mean, mm -hmm. Priscilla. Priscilla. Yeah. yeah. And so, I mean, but so that this has been ongoing, you know, for a long time and uh, Alan Dershowitz spent the first, I would say the first half of his career trying to lower the age of consent. Um, the, and what it really goes, what it, what it really, what it really is, is what the end game is. It's, it's young girls are neither a woman 
nor, you know, a boy, but they're closest looking to boys. So that the end game is we're all going to be unisex, right? Because that's where we're headed. We're, we're, we're getting rid of the women uh, and everybody is going to be one sex. That's really where we're going. So for these men who are attracted to young girls, it's because they're secretly homosexual, but in a world where machismo, in their world, machismo rules, um, some of them come out of the closet, but we're still at the time where uh, many of them are over 50. They're not going to come out of the closet. Kirby, what do you think about this notion that I had that part of this hidden agenda that we're seeing being played out in public, but it's up to people like you and me just to really tease it out and expand upon it, that really what's being promoted here is this um, post-gender ag uh, agenda that's being promoted under the guise of GLBTQ studies. Usually it's run out of women and gender studies, but now you have performance studies in all the major universities that are taking us into this post-human AI run society. And, and, and for that to happen, you have to debase women in particular, since as we already know from the story of Cologne, or Cologne is it? And also Betty Maxwell, it runs through the maternal line. That's where the, the strength is. It's the hand that rocks the cradle. But you're attacking uh, gender difference. This is part of the academic agenda. And I come from that world. And this is the lens through which I'm, I'm looking at. But I wanted you to comment here, and maybe I'm just kind of um, focusing on, on weirdness, but that's what I do for a profession. <laughs> but so there's something that, that Harvey Weinstein, Humble Harv, right? Humble Harv Weinstein and Jeffrey Epstein have in common. And that is non-existent malformed egg. It's been described by their victims as egg-shaped penises. Yes. So are they, are they intersexual? There's a woman at uh, Brown University, Anne Frostow, who coined the term intersexual. So are we seeing the pushing forward of this post-human agenda by foregrounding these individuals and taking people with these malformations, these egg-shaped penises? In the case of Harvey Weinstein, uh, according to some of the witnesses, he doesn't have anything resembling male genitalia. But both of these people are being presented in the mainstream and in the independent press as well as exclusively heterosexual predators. I think they're post-sexual predators. If in, people can... in, in mainstream media, they are being presented as a heterosexual, but even the victims themselves are aware that they are bisexual. Now, what's interesting is the notion of a hermaphrodite. If your audience is unaware of what that is. It is the um, a, a person who was born with both the female uh, genitalia as well as a male genitalia. What what Jeffrey Epstein had so for Glenn Maxwell's role, for example, I don't know how specific I can get, but um, I'm just going to say the word. Uh, uh, she she uh, taught the children, and I, they they were children to wear strap-on uh, pretend male part uh, in, in order to, um, uh, uh, um, how I'm gonna try to, to say this gently, in order to stimulate the men in an area that is usually something that gay men do to each other. So that what was happening was these, uh, you know, barely, they, these children barely had any breasts. They had these straight bodies, uh, the, you know, and they were given these extra parts in order to perform so that it was all very much um, uh, boy on boy, but you have a girl so that if can you follow what I'm saying? Yeah, well, this is the type of uh, dra drama that's being taught at performance studies at UCLA and at Columbia and New York University. They're into that. It's uh, ritualistic, uh, you know, people who have any just even a smattering of esoteric knowledge know about uh, Baphomet, right? 
This is a yeah. person with both male and female. They're they're post gender. They're not transgender. They're post gender, and that's what even the uh, people in independent media don't understand. And this whole uh, ritual sodomization uh, goes back to the mystery schools, uh, where where the anus is a, a portal to a higher state uh, of consciousness, right? And this is what's going on here. And I think Ghislaine Maxwell was was initiated into those mysteries herself. And well, is, uh, yeah, go ahead. Know, she, she, um, she was described by, uh, when I was doing the research for Ghislaine Maxwell and unauthorized biography, she was described by people who knew her when she was younger as, as rather uh, uh, andro androgynous sort of. So she didn't look like a girl necessarily. She didn't look like a boy that fit right in with the Epstein world. Um, she then cut her hair short. Um, number one, in, in that field, uh, if you have short hair, it doesn't get in your way. I mean, there were a lot of um, orgies uh, and not just on the island. People uh, sometimes have this mis mistaken belief that, that uh, the abuse only happened on the island. That's not true. Um, and so people think, well, if so-and-so is not on the flight log, that person is not guilty. That's not true. A lot of the abuse happened. That's why he had all of these homes. It happened in New York. It happened in Paris. It happened in New, New Mexico. It happened in Florida. Some of it happened on the island, but not all. Um, uh, so, I mean, it, it extends beyond sex, however. I, 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 do have, I do have a tip that I'll share with you and your audience. And perhaps if I'm invited back, I'll have more information. But you've heard of uh, Bohemian Grove, haven't you? Yes, it's not far from where I live. Oh, well, gee, have you gone? No. <laughs> I don't, I have not been extended an invitation, but I'm, I'm perhaps for, now you will. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm just their type. Well, um, I'm being ironic, you, ladies and gentlemen. I, well, I caught that too. <laughs> okay. I know you did. We have uh, it's some little minded people out there. So yeah. it's my understanding that they, they um, were at Bohemian Grove and that there's actually a photograph showing Jeffrey Epstein and Glenn Maxwell at Bohemian Grove. Now, for the people who don't understand what that is, why don't you help me out here and explain to them what it is? Because this, they can't keep hearing about all this shocking stuff just from me. Oh, yeah. Well, it's, uh, I don't know how many uh, hundreds of acres. It's in a pristine, uh, the California is blessed with these incredible redwoods that go, some of them date back to the time of Christ. And um this is a recent discovery of mine, and I have to confirm it from other sources, but I always thought it that uh, the Bohemian Grove was owned by the Bohemian Club, which is uh, headquartered across the San Francisco Bay in San Francisco. There's a building, Bo Bohemian Club. Uh, but you know who actually owns it? This is one source. Again, I have to confirm it. It's the Fleur Corporation, one of the largest, and of course, they're linked with intelligence, one of the largest privately, uh, I think they're privately held, uh, or maybe I'm thinking of Bechtel, but uh, it's one of these major globalist companies that runs the Bohemian Grove. And that is the annual conclave of all the super movers and shakers globally. That's where they uh, reputedly, uh, uh, reportedly elect future prime ministers and future presidents. Uh, Richard Milhouse Nixon was famously known to have gone there. And he said, this is the most queer situation I have ever been in. And uh, Richard Nixon has uh, seen a lot. So all the uh, people, I don't think, that, I don't know if Donald Trump, uh, he's probably read the literature, so he probably makes himself scarce there. But while all the attention's on, on Bohemian Grove, there is Mar-a-Lago, right? So yes. there, are, there are other conclaves and there are places. And I'm, I'm very much interested in what's going on in, in the state of New Mexico. I always thought it was um, just sort of a, a laid back 
uh, low cost state, but apparently it's become the new globalist state. Same, same with Montana. All these states out west are, are becoming uh, migratory landings for these uh, these individuals. And that's what your research has has really exposed me to that it's not just these isolated islands. It's not the the uh, mansion on uh, is it West Seventy uh, Sixth Street, right? Seventy first. Seventy first Street by Central Park. Uh, and I'm also, and I would like you to comment on this. And I realize I'm asking you to speculate at this point, but I'm also interested in what are called DUMs, which stands for Deep Underground Military Bases, oh. that are that are supposedly housing tons of underage boys and girls, men and women, perhaps, you know, the teenagers underage, in these large underground facilities, uh, the acronym that the military uses, DUM, Deep Underground Military Bases. What is your research uncovered on that, Kirby? I, I have not um, gone into there are children held underground, but I do know uh, that there are a lot of the uh, underground military bases, and I suspect that there's one in the area uh, where Jeffrey Epstein uh, purchased his first island, uh, Little St. James, uh, because there, they had, um, there was an, uh, an air shot taken and, and uh, Glenn's submarine, and so there's submarine docking, and there's um, an, an area that looks like one can, uh, sort of sort of walk into so it seems like there is an underground uh, old military base and of note and no one again has made any comment about this and sometimes I'm left scratching my head wondering if it's only me that thinks about these things and now of course you because you joined <laughs> my 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 sort of Oh my God, he thinks just like me. He's going to be my new best friend. Okay, but um, what did Jeffrey Epstein's father do? This is a quiz for you, and then I'm going to tell you what he did if you don't know the answer. Please, I don't know. Oh, well, Jeffrey Epstein's father, uh, Seymour, I think it's Seymour. Yes, I'm almost sure it's Seymour without having to look at my notes worked for the New York City Recreation and Parks Department. Now, what is that? That is a government run government, not state, gov federally run uh, that would include areas that have these subterranean military bases, such as uh, there is, um, what is it, Montauk? There, there's a subterranean base down there. So there's some subterranean bases in New York where Jeffrey Epstein's father worked. His mother, what was his mother? She was a school teacher. So there are, you know, there are these connections. And of course we know about Bill Barr's father, Donald, and all of that connection. Uh, but there seems to be um, areas that have been unexplored. It, it, in terms of how did Jeffrey Epstein become a spy? Uh, and, and that's where Jeffrey Epstein Predator Spy book comes in. But I think it's interesting that his father worked for the Parks Department and nobody has looked into that. I think that that is definitely connected to intelligence. Oh, absolutely. Now, do you think the Untermeyer Park up in uh, Yonkers was under the administrative purview of Jeffrey Seymour Epstein, Mr. Seymour Epstein? I don't know that. I don't okay. know that. No. Because that's where the uh, Son of Sam activity was centered in the 70s. That's and, true. And they do tend to take place in these public spaces, these ritual practices and the graffiti, the Staten Island, uh, you know, you're a native New Yorker, so you know about the uh, Staten Island connection, right? Placid, supposedly, until there were murders taking place at these abandoned mental facilities, hospitals, and parks and whatnot. Right. But, you know, um, that makes sense that Jeffrey Epstein's father would be involved at that level. Because, you know, they were not wealthy. Um, they only had the two children. He was born in 1953. 
no one's looking into his brother who, by the way, you know, is into real estate, but real estate that came from Leslie Wexner, uh, the building, apartment building at 301 East 66th Street is not only where Prime Minister Ehud Barak would stay on the 10th floor and he would have uh, sort of take over the lobby with his um, with his guards and um, utilize the 10th floor. And he was said by Virginia Jufre, who has identified some of the men that she was told to have sex with uh, by Jeffrey Epstein and Glenn Maxwell. She has identified both Leslie Wexner and Ehud Barak as being among those two men. Um, but no one's looked into the fact that Jeffrey Epstein's brother, Mark, and by the way, what is the name of his holding company for 301 East 66th Street? Drum roll. Ready? <laughs> I'm ready. Okay. It's OSA LLC. What are the two letters that are missing on either side of OSSA? Odessa? M O S S A D. Oh, okay. Yes. I know what that spells. Trouble. <laughs> so I mean, so, but but that's something that that uh if you if one is really looking at the documentation and the court records and you're digging in and you're looking at how um things are spelled and the acronyms that they use or and there's a lot of symbolism. Oh, this they is heavily it, Kabbalistic, isn't it? Yes, they leave it right there for everyone to see. And then because it's it's literally like if a child went home and said, oh, Ma, I had to have sex with the president of the United States today, or I just had sex with the prince, the, the parents are going to say, this is too big to believe. And that's the illusion that that's why they create this world that it's too big for other people to believe but the fact of the matter is that their children were telling the truth but the parents won't believe it because it sounds too outrageous so if you're looking at uh, mark epstein's theoretically his building 301 east 66th street which is owned by osa llc and, and you're somebody like me and you say, well, gee, those are the four letters uh, between the word Mossad. Uh, well, am I looking at something that's too, too, too obvious to be true? No, I'm looking at what they're telling me. They're telling me they're Mossad. Mm. Hidden in plain sight. They're creating these. Um, and I'm sure this was his, the assignment that he was given, the Dark Prince himself, Walt Disney. They're creating these cognitive Disneylands right? All these different, there's frontier land, adventure land, fantasy land, but it's right out there. You pay admission to it. And by the way, uh, the original Disneyland, and I grew up in that area, had all these passageways so that people that work there, they would never have to mingle with, with the, the tourists uh, up top. And I suspect that uh, Epcot Center, which was purchased incrementally by these phantom buyers, because real estate is central to this whole pr uh, program here, I assume that Epcot Center has a similar set of these hidden passageways and tunnels. So ladies and gentlemen, uh, this we don't have to go with uh, Jeffrey Epstein and his set, Leslie Wexner and the, 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 the perverted uh, kinky um, multimillionaires. We can just go to these amusement parks that are really, I think the model for the esoteric. These are the exoteric expressions of this esoteric tunneling and uh, passageways it comes right out of southern france where the uh, maxwell the um what were they called the mores uh, the family that bloodline it comes right out of that um uh that gothic tradition they were huguenots um yeah you know uh but the passageways uh jeffrey epstein's the building, let's say at 90 71st Street, that wasn't the only building that, that uh, Leslie Wexner purchased. He purchased the building next to him. Number 11, he purchased nine, he purchased number 11, 911, right? But um, <laughs> who's living at 11? Uh, in fact, it was, oh, 
his name escapes me, but he was the lucky guy who did who had to take his child to school on 9-11 and um, survived. And suddenly somehow he is Jeffrey Epstein's neighbor and the person to whom he sold the, the building to. The name will come to me at some point. I just don't have that. I didn't think we were going to talk about that. But to talk about passageways, there is a, a, a in New York City, there is um, a basement and then there is a, a cellar area. And it, that's a very old building. Um, it's a, and I'm in real estate, so I know the, the terrain. So there are most of these older buildings are connected. So I'm sure there's a connection uh, to, from Jeffrey Epstein's uh, mansion, which by the way, was given to him by Leslie Wexner for a dollar, completely furnished with um, real Picassos and just with the surveillance equipment already in there in place. Um, there, I'm sure there's, a, there's an underground connection to the next building. Now, wouldn't it wouldn't you think it'd be shocking to know that right be, behind Jeffrey Epstein's property so on 72nd street who owns that building the archdiocese hmm. it's just like the whole thing is just can it get any weirder and then leon black is one block away it's it, leslie wexner has a subterranean area in his Ohio mansion that he built it he created this almost um Stepford wife existence in by driving out the farmers and 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 creating these front companies and he would have people go and start offering these farmers who had lived on the land for centuries money and scaring them off and Finally, it was discovered, oh, it's Leslie Wexner. And he built himself uh, a town called New Albany, uh, where he owns the largest home. Uh, I forget how many acres it is on maybe like five minute walk away um, is a, a 30,000 square foot town home which is connected by the way with an underground passage. So no, so when he gave it to Jeffrey Epstein for it to be his home, nobody, nobody could, could see the two men going back and forth into each other's homes. It's, so yes, they have use of the underground passages. But if you want to hear a creepy story that I- I have you know, one I, comment. One of, one of the interesting yeah. parts about reading your, your, your book, Kirby, is that uh, now I understand why it's so rich in detail about these architectural and uh, residential landmarks, because you were professionally in yes. New York City real estate. So yes. better to, to be able to <laughs> observe and pick through and look at the esoteric, the hidden dimension of these. Well, you know, we pass by them every day and they're just, you know, giant monumental buildings. But you have this deep metaphysical insight into what these represent. Yeah, I was born in New York and I've always, um, well, I was always in the museum or in the library or walking up and down the buildings because we have everything from Art Deco buildings to neoclassical. And, and I, when I was able to get my life back, I, I became a real estate broker. And um, although I was, I was uh, constantly harassed and and um, my life was threatened, you know, I was, I was in danger because to present day, I'm still stalked by my uh, abuser, Ira Rickless. Um, I, 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 so I couldn't stay in, in, in the profession in, in, in the traditional way, but um, I, I was in it long enough to have access to a lot of the buildings that caught my attention um, and, and was able to see uh, oh, okay. This is this is the, this was the norm for the period. So, for example, using the subterranean tunnel to get from one building to the other without people knowing—that's something that I learned on site. Uh, you know, during my real estate career. 
Um, and, and it's something that I draw on today to write my books. I go back and I look at stuff. And, and, and frankly, there, there's by looking at a building and, and studying who the architect is, uh, you learn a lot about who the occupant is. Uh, in Jeffrey Epstein's case, as with Leslie Wexner, they used the same architect, the same designer. There are reasons for that, you know, that the, the certain people have a certain aesthetic and their aesthetic was an evil one. So they didn't you know have the to name? really. Do you know the name? Uh, of the I, I, I could, I could um, send it to you because uh, okay. I don't have it in front of me. Also, another research question uh, for myself, because uh, the, you've alluded to him twice in just this conversation. You spoke of Rosemary's baby, right? Yes. And uh, that was uh, situated in the Dakota in the film by, again, Roman Polanski. And then you just mentioned Stepford Wives. Uh, that Those novels, and I have them all, I, I've, uh, I gave myself an assignment to read the complete fiction of Ira Levin. He's also the person that wrote, I believe, Boys from Brazil, which is right. about cloning of uh, mm -hmm. Adolf uh, Aloysius uh, Rothschild, otherwise known as Hitler. Um, but you know what? There's nothing that I can find on Ira Levin. So I'm making an appeal to both your and my above average quality audience to start digging into Ira Levin. Who is this guy? Is he a J.D. Salinger type person who comes out of intelligence or a W.H. Auden who talks about the age of anxiety being part of the bombing survey or someone like Kurt Vonnegut? I think we have to look at Ira Levin as a very important mirror to understand this whole complex that you're digging into, Kirby. What do you think? I think that's a good idea. I mean, don't forget, we have Arnon Milchin, who uh, everybody thought was just a, a, a happy-go-lucky uh, Hollywood producer who made the film Pretty Woman. Well, wouldn't you know, he came out because he was outed, really, and that's the only reason he came out as a Mossad spy. Mm -hmm. uh, so that, you know, there are um, these connections. I know for the years that I was with Rickless, not only was the White House something that was part of his everyday life and the residents of the White House and certain politicians, but so was the fashion industry and so was Hollywood and the mob. So like, you know, so like I, I used to wonder why are all these, you know, his best, one of his best friends was, um, the man, I'm trying to remember his name, he produced the Michael Jackson video, um, a thriller. Um, so that was, and then another one was also kind of like, um, he hired all of the very famous models of the 80s that we're discussing. And then, uh, of course, he had his people that he and his father would send up, commencing from Kennedy uh, to today. Biden and, and people may, they get very, what I've noticed is um, people are not ready to give up their idolistic view of, of politics. And so if you say something about their favorite politician or their favorite actor or their favorite whoever, instead of looking at the underlying problem of human trafficking, which is a human rights violation, it's a human rights crime, it's something that should be number one, on our things to eradicate as a people for everyone. We, are, we, we should all have human rights and the safety of not only our children, but our vulnerable people. And by vulnerable, I don't mean necessarily someone who is handicapped. I mean, naive uh, young people who are lured by false promises by people like Jeffrey Epstein. So instead of having that at the forefront, People have their idols like Donald Trump or now like the new president, Joe Biden, or in the past, they had an idol like, like Nixon, all these false idols. And, and, and really um, what people have to understand is that the, the, the funnel to becoming powerful and to becoming a, a, the president or the leader of any country is, is a very narrow one. And, and the, the higher someone goes, the less power that person has because that person 
owes their rise to these nefarious characters that we're talking about. So people should stop looking at who is the, 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 the head puppet and look at the puppeteers and, and, and be more of a humanitarian and not place your, your, your belief so strongly in people who are elected falsely, by the way, because the election system is a sham, into these government positions. I, I just, I, I've been heartbroken to see the, how people are divided uh, depending on, oh, are we gonna talk about Trump? Are we gonna talk about, Clinton? you know, it's just, to me, it's like, once those people start doing that, I block them from being able to read my tweets. No, I think that's wise. Um, you know, we have to figure out, and I, I think you're, you're on the course, um, but we have to figure out a way to, to deprive these uh, idols, these false idols, or I guess all idols are false by definition, right? But deprive them of our energies. And I think, I don't think, I believe writing such as yours, right? Nonfiction, journalism, but also uh, fiction, really good quality fiction. F. Scott Fitzgerald, going back another generation, was breaking down the secret societies of Princeton University, where he dropped out from, right? which is run by the, uh, the House of Orange. Uh, this is another secret society that's not so secret. But I think books like yours, people who are testifying to the truth, really break down the energetics that these people feed on. That's what they seem to be thriving on. That's their, their energizer battery. They harvest energy, sexual energy, youthful energy, physical energy, uh, psychic energy. But we have our own Kabbalistic strength, if you want to refer to that. And that is the word, that is the written word, that is communication. It's conversations such that we're having today, Kirby, for the benefit of a larger, a much larger audience. That's it. That is what I believe constitutes justice. You've already mentioned the illegitimacy of the just us system for them, right? You've already mentioned the the fraud perpetrated on the American people and most societies of political, uh, the electoral system in the United States in specific we're talking about. But I have an expanded uh, notion of justice because I don't believe in these institutions. I believe in humanity. I believe in you. I believe in myself. I believe in the people who are listening to our conversation. That is where the legitimacy comes from. And that comes from God. That's That's divine legitimacy. So I view what you're doing, your work, your incredible series of books, and I'm looking forward to the sequel of the Glenn Maxwell one. It's in preparation, I assume. And yes. uh, maybe before we end, you can tell us when it's going to drop, because believe me, I'm me and many, many others are waiting for that. But I think by my expanded notion of justice, that we are getting justice. You are getting justice by your books because you're exposing truth with a capital T. And these other institutions, these fallible, human, corrupt institutions, I mean, this goes back to the myths of civilization. It's not going to change. But what has been the, the, the current, what's been the constant ever since literacy came about and the written word and even the oral tradition of the Norsemen of other societies that don't have a written language. What has been our power? What has been our, our justice system? That is conversation. It's the word, it's consciousness. Yes, so I, I mean, thank you for that. Well, thank you so much. Um, it, it, it's been only really word of mouth that has gotten my books sold. And I've sold so many. Um, I, I, in order to finish Glenn Maxwell Blackmail, which is the sequel of Glenn Maxwell, an unauthorized biography, because I just want to make it clear that when I sat down to write uh, the, the book on Glenn Maxwell, I thought uh, that I could cover her whole life in one volume. However, I realized that mainstream media had omitted such large portions of her life. And of course, her father needed to be explained to a younger audience that I pretty much that first book, as you know, is primarily about 
the first half of her life until she connects with Jeffrey Epstein in 1991. So Glenn Maxwell blackmail, you should be ready by, by I would think um, March, April, the latest, but I needed to go back and revise and expand upon the uh, chapter of her mother because I needed to be able to show a continuity of that world in a Glenn Maxwell blackmail. And, and, but it has been, like you say, it's word of mouth. It's conversation that we have amongst ourselves. We're the only ones that are going to um, lead the way and explain to everyone what's happening. And we do it as a, as a unit because I get inspiration from my followers who ask me certain questions. And it's like, okay, this is what they're interested in. And I see you do the same thing. And, and, you know, I think the, the audience today is not as easily hoodwinked because we're not going to get this from mainstream. <laughs> no, the beauty of it is, is that you are bypassing so-called mainstream media. That's a misnomer. We are the mainstream. We've always been the mainstream media. We've always well, been the mainstream justice system. It's a parable straight from the Wizard of Oz, uh, just to use a more common example. The power has always been with us, Curry Summers. It's always been so. That's why I'm not going to be so brokenhearted when Ghislaine Maxwell skates, right? Given the fact that you've presented the backstory on this crooked judge that's down there and she, her connections to Biden and her arbitrary disappearances, stolen elections, <laughs> all of it. But you see, we, if we believe in ourselves, we, we know that we do have the heart, the brain, the spirit, the courage in ourselves. I think that's going to win the day. At least it's going to buy us another day <laughs> for the, for the well, next battle, because this is a perennial fight. Yeah, I mean, I, I from the time I was 17, I was in mainstream media. Um, however, they've scrubbed me from all of the coverage. And I, and I spent three years uh, doing pro bono work for Hurricane Katrina survivors. And again, I was in mainstream media covered by many uh, newspapers and, and I was scrubbed. Uh, I was on Wikipedia, I was scrubbed. My work has been scrubbed. Uh, I've had publishers one after the other. I was offered $9 million many, many years ago for my memoir so that I've had and, and up until recently, you know, I've had publishers who want to come after me for these books, but after knowing what they do and, and, and how they change, I decided, you know what, no, thank you. I, I, I have made it this far. I'm going to just go ahead and put them up on Amazon and they're doing great. Uh, I was immediately for the summer, I was uh, for both Jeffrey Epstein, Predator Spy, and Glenn Maxwell, an unauthorized biography. I was a, a bestseller for the new releases. Um, obviously, the, the, the uh, people who don't want the truth to be told are so busy putting one-star reviews to lower my ranking, but it doesn't lower the sales because people want, they know Kirby's telling the truth. We can follow her work on Twitter, and we see that she logically connects this to this to this to this so they're not buying the attempted smear let's say and i'm not taking the money from mainstream i don't want it anymore well that's great i mean it tickles me pink when i see and i get to talk to people who are getting over on the bad guys and i'm hearing <laughs> stories like this all I'm, i've alluded to the great manny gross grossman who's north of you up there who's doing this follow-up work on the son of sam killings which i think is kind of related to this milieu that that you are uh, writing about as well and our numbers are growing and um i come from the academic world and uh, my uh, agenda is to uh, expose the connection between academia and the world that you have described in such great depth after all who was shoveling all this money to Joichi Ito, who was a male prostitute in Kabukicho in Tokyo. It was right. one of, none other than Jeffrey Epstein, the same way with the Charles Lieber down in Harvard over and over again. So as we're wrapping up here, you just know that you have a comrade in arms here, and I'm going to be shining a light on the rat hole known as the contemporary public and private university. And my project there, and it's copyrighted, ladies and gentlemen, it's going to be known as 
collegiate gothic. Do you like it? Bravo, yes. Yes, a true crime series. Are you listening, it Netflix? <laughs> <laughs> Don't sell out. Today. No, I'm not. <laughs> I'm going to use the Kirby Summers patented model of public communications. Yeah, and 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 you know, publish your own book, uh, even if you have to create an LLC for it, I might have to do that. You know, I know that Sean Atwood has created his own LLC to bypass the publishers so that we can get the truth out to the people. Uh, I think people are wise. Well, I, I listen, I, I want to thank you sincerely from the bottom of my heart for when I saw you talking about my books on your show and and saying, well, the cover and the title are sensational, but this book is really good. And, and, you know, you guys should read it. I was like, oh my God, that's music to my ears because, you know, it's, it's it, who, who wants to believe that there's actually a woman walking around who was a sex slave to a billionaire and it's, and, and who actually is a forensic um, investigator. A few people I was not supposed to survive, but I did. So, and I thank you for finding me and for having me on your show. It's, it's been an honor. Well, it, the honor has been all mine. And as we wrap up Kirby again, I'd like to thank you for all the wonderful work you're doing. I advise everybody in the listening audience to buy the hard copies, have them in your physical possession of uh, from the I won't even mention their name the retailer that ate the world buy copies of multiple copies of Kirby Summers's books and look for the volume two I guess it is or is it going to be revision that's going to drop in uh, March April of the coming year and Kirby as we close I think 2022 is going to be a banner year for one Kirby Summers I can feel it I can see it I know a winner when I encounter one, you're, you're definitely <laughs> well, a wonderful, you. beautiful person. Thank you for coming on this show. Thank you. Best wishes for a happy new year for you too. Happy new year. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. With that, we will conclude our wonderful interview with Kirby Summers. Thanks again, Ms. Summers. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.